Good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to our Good Friday service of the Passion. Just three important short announcements so that we don't need to have any announcements during the service. First of all, when we come to the reading of St. John's Passion in your booklet, please, everybody, join in. The parts are marked as crowd parts. Please, everybody, join in those parts. They're clearly marked. When we come to the veneration of the cross, as we did last year, we ask, please, that you do not kiss the cross, but that you genuflect or bow, and you may touch the cross reverently. At the end of the service, the cross will be left in place for private veneration. Thank you. At the end of the service, as in every Catholic Good Friday, three o'clock service, we have a second collection, which is to support the holy places in the Holy Land, the upkeep of all those sites associated with the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord. So that's the retiring collection as you leave the service. Thank you.
O God, who by the passion of Christ your Son, our Lord, abolished the death inherited from ancient sin by every succeeding generation, grant that just as being conformed to him, we have borne by the law of nature the image of the man of earth, so by the sanctification of grace, we may bear the image of the man of heaven. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Reading from the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant will prosper. He shall be lifted up, exalted, rise to great heights. As the crowds were appalled on seeing him, so disfigured did he look, that he seemed no longer human. So will the crowds be astonished at him, and kings stand speechless before him. For they shall see something never told, and witness something never heard before. Who could believe what we have heard? And to whom has the power of the Lord been revealed? Like a sapling, he grew up in front of us, like a root in arid ground, Without beauty, without majesty, we saw him. No looks to attract our eyes, a thing despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, a man to make people screen their faces. He was despised and we took no account of him. And yet, Ours were the sufferings he bore, ours the sorrows he carried. But we thought of him as someone punished, struck by God and brought low. Yet he was pierced through for our faults, crushed for our sins. On him lies a punishment that brings us peace and through his wounds we are healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each taking his own way, and the Lord burdened him with the sins of all of us. Harshly dealt with, he bore it humbly. He never opened his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughterhouse, like a sheep that is dumb before its shearers, never opening its mouth. By force and by law he was taken. Would anyone plead his cause? Yes, he was torn away from the land of the living, for our fault struck down in death. They gave him a grave with the wicked, a tomb with the rich, though he had done no wrong, and there had been no perjury in his mouth. The Lord has been pleased to crush him with suffering. If he offers his life in atonement, he shall see his heirs. He shall have a long life, and through him what the Lord wishes will be done. His soul's anguish over, he shall see the light and be content. By his sufferings shall my servant justify many taking their faults on himself. Hence, I will grant whole hordes for his tribute. He shall divide the spoil with the mighty for surrendering himself to death and letting himself be taken for a sinner while he was bearing the faults of many and praying all the time for sinners. The word of the Lord.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Since in Jesus, the Son of God, we have the supreme high priest who has gone through to the highest heaven, we must never let go of the faith that we have professed. For it is not as if we had a high priest who was incapable of feeling our weaknesses with us, but we have one who has been tempted in every way that we are, though he is without sin. Let us be confident then in approaching the throne of grace, that we shall have mercy from him and find grace when we are in need of help. During his life on earth, he offered up prayer and entreaty, aloud and in silent tears, to the one who had the power to save him out of death. And he submitted so humbly that his prayer was heard. Although he was son, he learnt to obey through suffering. But having been made perfect, he became, for all who obey him, the source of eternal salvation. The word of the Lord. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kedron Valley. There was a garden there, and he went into it with his disciples. Judas, the traitor, knew the place well, since Jesus had often met his disciples there. And he brought the cohort to this place, together with a detachment of guards sent by the chief priests and the Pharisees, all with lanterns and torches and weapons. Knowing everything that was going to happen to him, Jesus came forward and said, Who are you looking for? Jesus, they answered, Jesus the Nazarene. He said, I am he. Now Judas, the traitor, was standing among them. When Jesus said, I am he, they moved back and fell to the ground. He asked them a second time, Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus replied, I have told you that I am he. If I am the one you are looking for, let these others go. This was to fulfill the words he had spoken. Not one of those you gave me have I lost. Simon Peter, who carried a sword, drew it and wounded the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. That servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back in its scabbard. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? The cohort and its captain and the Jewish guards seized Jesus and bound him. They took him first to Annas, because Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had suggested to the Jews, it is better for one man to die for the people. Simon Peter, with another disciple, followed Jesus. This disciple, who was known to the high priest, went with Jesus into the high priest's palace, but Peter stayed outside the door. So the other disciple, the one known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who was keeping the door, and brought Peter in. The maid on duty at the door said to Peter, Aren't you another of that man's disciples? 
He answered, I am not. Now it was cold, and the servants and guards had lit a charcoal fire and were standing there warming themselves. So Peter stood there too, warming himself with the others. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly for all the world to hear. I have always taught in the synagogue and in the temple where all the Jews meet together. I have said nothing in secret. But why ask me? Ask my hearers what I taught. They know what I said. At these words, one of the guards standing by gave Jesus a slap in the face, saying, Is that the way to answer the high priest? Jesus replied, If there is something wrong in what I said, point it out. But if there is no offence in it, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him, still bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. As Simon Peter stood there warming himself, someone said to him, Aren't you another of his disciples? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relation of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at once a cock crew. They then led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the Praetorium. It was now morning. They did not go into the Praetorium themselves, or they would be defiled and unable to eat the Passover. So Pilate came outside to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They replied, If he were not a criminal, we should not be handing him over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and try him by your own law. The Jews answered, We are not allowed to put a man to death. This was to fulfill the words Jesus had spoken, indicating the way he was going to die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and called Jesus to him and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus replied, Do you ask this of your own accord, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? It is your own people and the chief priests who have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, Mine is not a kingdom of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my men would have fought to prevent me being surrendered to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this kind. Pilate said, So you are a king then? Jesus answered, It is you who say it. Yes, I am a king. I was born for this. I came into the world for this, to bear witness to my truth. And all who are on the side of truth listen to my voice. Pilate said, Truth? What is that? And with that he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no case against him, but according to a custom of yours, I should release one prisoner at the Passover. Would you like me then to release the king of the Jews? At this they shouted, Not this man, but Barabbas. Barabbas was a brigand. Pilate then had Jesus taken away and scourged. And after this, the soldiers twisted some thorns into a crown and put it on his head, and dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Pilate came outside again and said to them, Look, I am going to bring him out to you to let you see that I find no case. Jesus then came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said, Here is the man. When they saw him, the chief priests and the guards shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I can find no case against him. The Jews replied, 
We have a law, and according to the law, he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard them say this, his fears increased. Re-entering the praetorium, he said to Jesus, Where do you come from? But Jesus made no answer. Pilate then said to him, Are you refusing to speak to me? Surely you know I have power to release you, and I have power to crucify you. Jesus replied, You would have no power over me if it had not been given you from above. That is why the one who handed me over to you has the greater guilt. From that moment, Pilate was anxious to set him free, but the Jews shouted, If you are set him free, you are no friend of Caesar's. Anyone who makes himself king is defying Caesar. Hearing these words, Pilate had Jesus brought out and seated himself on the chair of judgment at a place called the pavement, in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was Passover preparation day, about the sixth hour. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They said, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said, Do you want me to crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king except Caesar. So in the end, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. They then took charge of Jesus and carrying his own cross, he went out of the city to the place of the skull, or as it is called in Hebrew, Golgotha, where they crucified him with two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate wrote out a notice and had it fixed to the cross. It ran, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. This notice was read by many of the Jews because the place where Jesus was crucified was not far from the city, and the writing was in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests said to Pilate, You should not write King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had finished crucifying Jesus, they took his clothing and divided it into four shares, one for each soldier. His undergarment was seamless, woven in one piece from neck to hem. So they said to one another, Instead of tearing it, let's throw dice to decide who is to have it. In this way, the words of scripture were fulfilled. They shared out my clothing among them. They cast lots for my clothes. This is exactly what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Seeing his mother and the disciple he loved standing near her, Jesus said to his mother, Woman, this is your son. Then to the disciple he said, This is your mother. And from that moment, the disciple made a place for her in his home. After this, Jesus knew that everything had now been completed. And to fulfill scripture perfectly, he said, I am thirsty. A jar full of vinegar stood there. So putting a sponge soaked in vinegar on a hyssop stick, they held it up to his mouth. After Jesus had taken the vinegar, he said, It is accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit.
It was preparation day, and to prevent the bodies remaining on the cross during the Sabbath, since that Sabbath was a day of special solemnity, the Jews asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken away. Consequently, the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with him, and then of the other. When they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead. So instead of breaking his legs, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a lance, and immediately there came out blood and water. This is the evidence of one who saw it, trustworthy evidence, and he knows he speaks the truth, and he gives it so that you may believe as well. Because all this happened to fulfill the words of scripture, not one of his bones will, he, will be broken. And again, in another place, scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one, because he was afraid of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him remove the body of Jesus. Pilate gave permission, so they came and took it away. Nicodemus came as well, the same one who had first come to Jesus at night time, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, following the Jewish burial custom. At the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in this garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. Since it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was near at hand, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In a few moments, we will be invited to come forward quietly, reverently, and intimately to venerate the cross of Christ. It's a deeply personal moment, but also it's a profoundly communal moment because we are the church in this place. We are the body of Christ, brought together always by his death and resurrection for us. What does it mean for you or for me to venerate the cross of Christ? What part do we allow the cross to play in our daily life? So much of the answer to that question I believe, has to be found in silence. The silence of faith and the silence of love. We stand when we face the cross before the greatest mystery of sacrifice, the greatest self-giving, the greatest act of sacrificial love. We stand before the greatest showing of love the world will ever see. How can we not be moved to silence in the face of such love? St. Paul, who wrote powerfully about the cross and Christ crucified, calls the cross a language. 
a new language of love. A scandal to many, madness to many, but to we who receive and welcome Christ crucified as Lord and Saviour, the cross is the very power and the very wisdom of God. And we know as his disciples that the language of the cross, the language of sacrificial love, has to be our language. From the cross, Jesus upturns all worldly ideas of power, of dominance, of manipulation, of violence. The logic of the cross, the logic of Jesus, is non-violent, loving mercy. Through utmost faithfulness to the will of the Father, his Father, our Father. Who can ever forget, if you wit witnessed it, that extraordinary moment in 2005, a few hours before his death, when Pope John Paul II, Saint John Paul II, for the last time appeared to the huge crowd gathered in St. Peter's, a crowd full of emotion, of hope, of gratitude, of sadness. And Pope John Paul was so weak that he could not speak. He was so weak in body that he could barely lift his hand. And yet with all his last strength, he raised his hand and he signed the cross over the world and the church. When we come forward in a moment to genuflect, to bow, to gently touch the cross with love, let's do so knowing that he really did die personally for each and every one of us with a love that is beyond measure, a love that will always reduce us to silence. And let us say simply, thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for me. Let us ask him to send us from the cross to bring that love to others so that others, many, all people, can confidently take shelter in the shadow of his cross, in the shadow of such love. We now stand for the general intercessions. The solemn intercessions of the church. <clears throat> for Holy Church, let us pray dearly beloved for the Holy Church of God that our God and Lord be pleased to give her peace, to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world, and grant that, leading our life in tranquility and quiet, we may glorify God the Father Almighty. Almighty ever-living God, who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations, watch over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Pope, let us pray also for our most holy father, Pope Francis, 
that our God and Lord, who chose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favour on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you their Maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all orders and degrees of the faithful, let us pray also for our Bishop Richard, for all bishops, priests and deacons of the church and for the whole of the faithful people. Almighty ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. For catechumens, let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts and unlock the gates of his mercy, that, having received forgiveness of all their sins through the waters of rebirth, they, too, may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Almighty, ever-living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. For the unity of Christians, let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, look kindly on the flock of your Son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity, through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people, to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name and in faithfulness of his covenant. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that, enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too may enter on the way of salvation. Almighty, ever-living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart they may find the truth and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that, following what is right in sincerity of heart, they may find the way to God himself. Almighty, ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you and by finding you, come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, 
all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you. And so in gladness, confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will, for the true peace and freedom of all. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hands lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favour, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us and throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of all errors, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travellers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick and salvation to the dying. Almighty, ever-living God, comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil, may the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Behold the word of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
Behold the word of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world. Behold the word of the cross on which hung the salvation of the world.
at the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be.
Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy that by partaking of this mystery we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bow down for the blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honoured the death of your Son in the hope of their resurrection. May pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.